Hello and welcome to The Round So Far, brought to you by Amy Riley Beverage and Kane Corns with you. And Kane will start this big episode at the SCG, where the Swans got over the line against the Bombers. They killed them in transition. Didn't Plenty they? happening in this game. We'll get to all the drama and all the big hits shortly, but this was where the game was won. Essendon actually really strong around the football and from clearance and contested footy and ground ball, but... Sydney cut them up from their defensive half. And you just look at this. There's nothing scientific about this. This is just play footy, make it up. You were drafted because you've got elite talent and they've got elite speed and elite running power. So they make it up, the forward handball and the endurance and speed and power that this side has. I'm not sure anyone else can match them when the ball gets in transition like this. And you couple that with their elite ball users. I mean, they, they can all kick the footy and that was on display tonight. So the concern for Essendon is this has been a problem for so long. Yeah, why well, 80 odd points off turnover Sydney kick tonight yep. and Essendon haven't been able to defend off their own turnovers and in transition they continually get cut up, mm. and they got cut up tonight. One man who profits from the transition more than just about anyone in the comp is Errol Goulden. Have a look at this, Kane, because he set up this goal for Hayden McLean. He gets the ball, he's tipped what, 20 metres from his own goal and just watch the work ethic across the entirety it's of the ground. Amazing. So first of the kick, he kicks at 30, Warner cuts back inside and he just goes. Now, it's amazing that not one Essendon player goes with him or even checks his run. So if I'm an Essendon supporter, I'm going, what, what are we doing? We know that we struggle in transition and we struggle to defend and we've just let one of the most dangerous players in the game run mm. from back pocket to kick the ball inside forward 50 and no one went anywhere near him and showed him any respect. So he was huge tonight, but they're everywhere. They're everywhere at Sydney. Warner yeah. was big again. Heaney's having just an unbelievable season, the hottest player in the competition right now. Campbell used the footy really mm. well. They've got Wicks, they've got McInerney, they've got Blakey the Lizard. There is speed and ball users everywhere and they've still got some big names to come back in. It's frightening. It's going to be fascinating to see how they balance that midfield group when the likes of Mills and Parker come back. Now, you mentioned it was a dramatic contest. It all started with this flashpoint when Peter Wright, just minutes into the game, this late to, late to a marking contest, he knocks out Harry Cunningham. I think the way this has been adjudicated in the past, the fact that he takes his eyes off the ball late, this is a tribunal incident for me. Yeah, I think there's a duty of care to the player that's going back with the flight of the ball. And he braces or bumps, whichever way you want to use it, he hits him high and the players yeah. can cuss. So that's three plus straight to the tribunal. Yeah. I don't see, I just see it black and white. Yeah. I just think that is three or four weeks. That is where it will land. And players have to be better at protecting each other on the field. If you elect to bump, you get them high, they get concussed, they go off and don't take any further yeah. part you're in serious trouble. And it was a good response from Sydney yeah. as well. I thought they flew the flag really strongly and it wasn't the only eventful um, thing that we saw on the night. No, it certainly wasn't. This game has a habit of producing bizarre moments. There was another one here. Travis Cloak, who is the Essendon runner, getting involved in a little bit of push and shove. He's get, to be fair to him, he's getting rid of all of the Essendon players from the contest. He doesn't make contact with a Sydney player. But I'm not sure I've seen this before. I don't think it can happen. It wouldn't surprise me if he gets a please explain from the AFL early next week. No, I've, I've had some fiery runners at Port Adelaide. We had one called David Arnfield, and he got involved in all the action. My brother got himself into some trouble when he was runner. So he shouldn't be there. You're right. He's trying to do the right thing. But let's not go over the top. It's just mm. a please explain what were you doing. Don't do it again. Because I think his intentions were right. That was to de-escalate the situation yeah. and get his own players away from it. So I don't think you should get in trouble or fine. Just to please explain and probably don't do it again. It was a bizarre night. Tom Papley spoke about the physicality as well. He said he thought Essendon was targeting Sydney off the ball, which was interesting. I found that really interesting. He spoke to the Channel 7 at halftime and said that. Isaac Heaney after the game Do you reckon they well. went over the top, Essendon? The Essendon edge, which they spoke I about all I don't think they went over the top. I, I, I don't think, for example, the Peter Wright incident was something that was pre-planned to try and run through a bloke early in the game. I think that was just circumstantial that it seemed to happen. But... But Isaac Heaney's comments after the game were really interesting. That They had it up on the whiteboard at quarter time. How long can Essendon keep doing this? How long can they keep being physical? And he made a point of saying Sydney was happy that they ran over the top of them towards the end. And so. we had the incident with, with Luke Parker and Dylan Shield and, and mm. this one a, a year or so ago. And Essendon were accused of not responding. So they would have had that in their minds as well, as well as the history. So I, I don't think they went over the top. I thought they were really strong and competitive. They win ground ball. They win contested possession mm. they just got cut up on on defense and yep. that is an issue that has been there for six seven years at the bombers let's head to the mcg now where melbourne easily dispatched hawthorne they kicked five goals to nothing in the first quarter we're going to speak about the way the hawks started this game tactically but 
Melbourne just got away from the mill and yeah. held that advantage. Just too big. Uh, men against boys, really, in this game of footy. When you look at the stoppage dominance from Melbourne, and we'll look at the numbers in the first quarter shortly, but across the board, Melbourne kicked nine goals from stoppage to four points, and they smashed them from centre bounce. So starting to be somewhat of an issue for Sam Mitchell's team, of course. Some of their prime movers aren't there, in particular Will Day, but their midfield was well beaten today. Mm. They'd be really disappointed from that performance. I don't think anyone expected Hawthorne to win, but they would have expected a much stronger performance around the footy, and Melbourne just took them to task in that area. There was a clear plan, I think, from Hawthorne to keep the ball away from Jake Lever and Stephen May in the early parts of this game. And you can see that 53 marks in the first quarter alone, but then they got beaten in the middle and they were five goals down a quarter time. Yeah, and most of those marks are in their back half yeah. or in the back 50. And, and Melbourne are just going, OK, well, you can have it back there. That's giving us so much time to set up and defend. And then when they did try and possess it or take a hard one through the middle of the ground, Melbourne turned it over and they were gone and they were kicking the footy into an empty Melbourne forward line. Fritch kicked five, Pickett kicked three early and they went to work. So it was really deflating to watch it and the crowd was frustrated yeah. because you just knew these kicks were junk. I think Sicily had nine uncontested marks mm. in the first quarter and they were going nowhere. So they just got their game plan wrong. Whether that was the message and the players took it to the extreme, yeah. to their credit, they did readjust after quarter time couple of worries for Melbourne. They lost Stephen May to broken ribs following this incident involving Mabio Chol. He was taken to hospital midway through this game. Jake Lever also limped from the field with a knee injury later in the contest. Yeah, that's a nasty one, isn't it? I mean, mm. the, the knee up is still the most dangerous thing that you can do in football. And look at that. It's a bit confronting. If you've got broken ribs, you're not playing next week. And broken ribs can linger for six, seven, yeah. you know, a couple of months. And that one there, I'm not sure, pretty innocuous. Yeah, As you said, he, he spoke after the game and he, he seems pretty confident that it's nothing too serious and precautionary. But uh, it's probably another criticism of Hawthorne that they lost their two best key defenders mm -hmm. and interceptors and the Hawks still got smashed. Harry Petty having to go down back for Melbourne in the second half. All right, let's get to our moment now, Kane. And I absolutely loved this. It came with, what's there, six minutes to go. Melbourne at 50 points up. And have a look at Christian Petrarca here. He's been one of the best on ground offensively the whole way through the game. But this defensive effort just about drew as much applause as any moment in the, across the entire afternoon. Yeah, so it's inspirational because he's been known for his offence and his brilliance in that space. But with six minutes to go in the game and you're up by 50 points and to have your best player still do that. So you'll see where he starts for. We've highlighted him there. He's blue with the inner the outer red circle there and how far does he run when he's got tied legs early on in the season? It doesn't have to do that. He could give up that goal and no one would care, but I loved the response mm. from him as well. Yeah. Like, he celebrated that <laughs> like he kicked a goal yep. and everyone came from everywhere and that is uplifting. So, I mean, their, their culture's been questioned and mm. there's been some serious questions over it, and I think rightly so. That, to me, says they're using that as yep. motivation and who knows how far that can carry them this year because if they stay sound, you know, they've got a good enough team and an experienced enough team to, to win the Premiership. Let's stay at the MCG now, but on Thursday night, we're calling with the reigning Premier fell to 0-3 on the season. And you want to highlight some moments that seemed un-Collingwood-like, didn't they? Yeah, so I would never call an AFL footballer soft that crosses the white line, but I will call them jumpy and timid. And that's what I saw from Collingwood, and that is completely the opposite of what we saw in the back half of last year. Jordan Degoe there doesn't run straight line, one hands it. We saw skill error after skill error. We saw players going to ground like Mitchell there. Don't go to ground. Why are you going to ground? We saw side bottom with a weak effort there going one-handed and a walking goal. But th this probably happened... I'm going to say 30 times for the night. I thought Nick Dacos was really poor in that area. Craig McRae spoke about his best players fumbling and getting the fundamentals wrong after the game. So mm. to me, it looked like they didn't want to absorb contact and they couldn't cope with the heat. And that says to me that there's other teams go, OK, did you see that? And did you see the way they couldn't handle the heat mm. when the Saints brought it? And Ross Lyon said after the game that there's some signatures that the other teams are now starting to pick up yeah. against Collingwood. So have they been worked out? And are they prepared to, prepared to pay the price that they paid last year physically? I thought it was a very jumpy, a very timid. I won't go as far as saying it was soft, but it was nearly a soft performance. Are you worried about their experienced players, Kane? Because have a look at this here. Collingwood 
their, their senior players. So Jordan Degoe, Crisp, Tom Mitchell, Steel Cyber and Jeremy Howe and Scott Penderbury. That's their ranking points from the qualifying final to the grand final last year compared to the first three games of this season. All of them down on form. And that's their age. So, you, mm. so you're one year older. Perhaps your preparation wasn't as strong as it, it should be. But that, that, that's getting up there. Not many play past 36. He looked finished to me. Penderbury, it's going to come at some stage. That's not a criticism. That's just the facts. How early days in his return. Side bottom looked awful. Mitchell keeps going to ground. Crisp isn't the same. And... The goal, he's hardly touched it to yeah. start the season. And Chuck in Darcy Moore, who mm. is completely at sea as well into that, and probably a couple of others like Quainor and Maynard not having the impact. Bobby Hill's not the player that he was mm. in the final series. So when your best players aren't playing well and there's that significant a drop-off, what hope does everyone else have? You mentioned the signatures that Ross Lyon said he picked up. One of them has been stopping Collingwood's intercept marks because they had 15 at one stage at half-time and they only took four in the second half. So clearly St Kilda were trying to be a bit more efficient going forward. So that's coaching, isn't it? Like You know that that's been a weakness. He said last year that I think they were 18th at conceding intercept marks in their forward 50. So they know that's a problem. And then Collingwood come out and take 15 in the first half. So at half-time, you readjust and you do things differently, you urge your forwards to compete and get the footy on the ground. And then they did that and they start marking the footy, but players like Henry, once the ball gets to ground, they went to work. Higgins, he's got no chance if Collingwood are marking the footy. Mm. If it comes to ground, though, that's where, he, that's where he loves it. So we'll speak about Adelaide and the lack of tactics on Tom Stewart shortly, but the coaching from Ross Lyon to identify that yeah. and for the players to respond at half-time changed the course of the game. He's got a couple of young guns on his hands, Ross Lyon, as well. None more so than Naziah Wanganin Malira. He was absolutely fantastic. He had 32 disposals at 82% efficiency, 11 marks, 8 intercepts. His kicking is unbelievable. So this is well. footy in 2024, and we just showed it from Sydney. This is the Saints version of what Sydney are doing. Get your elite ball users across halfback, those with speed, those with courage that are prepared to use the ball and take risks. Get the footy in their hands and then go and make it up. There's nothing, as, as I said, you can't sit on a whiteboard and draw this because it's unpredictable. Mm. But he doesn't know where he's going to kick this. But as soon as he sees it, he, he goes. And he's not afraid to take that risky kick one on three. And then that opens up the whole thing. So... There's been that pick up there was just extraordinary. But the yeah. criticism around the Saints is do mm. they generate enough entries? Can they score enough? Well, that's been a big advancement in their game. Henry was huge as well, I thought. Yeah. Obviously, the injury hurts. It does. Have a look at this. This is some of their younger players. So, as we mentioned, Wangani Malira is only 21. Windhager and Owens are 20. Max King's the veteran of this group, and he's only 23. But they led the charge on Thursday night. Yeah, I thought King was huge late in the game mm. as well when Collingwood were coming. Came up really high and took a couple of really pressure-releasing contested marks down the line. Yeah. So, good hands. I still think they're probably three of those types short. And they're going to have to go to the draft to find them in coming years. Max King, of course, copped a one-match ban. He's looking like he'll miss next week's game against Essendon, although they are considering challenging that at the tribunal. Then, of course, as you mentioned, Liam Henry hurt with a hamstring and Mason Wood uh, also got knocked out and broke his collarbone in that nasty collision. All right, let's get to Marvel Stadium now where Fremantle, they were 32 points down to North Melbourne. Then they turned it on. Nine straight goals in the second half. Yeah, the game just changed at the back end of the second quarter. So um, North Melbourne got out to a 33-point lead at the 18-minute mark of the second quarter. This is the third quarter that we're showing here. And it was from the back half once again. That's a, a, a sloppy piece of play defensively from Shees or Brayshaw kicked the goal. So Fremantle took 33 uncontested marks in the third quarter alone. And they were able to transition the ball, march the ball up. And then there was a lack of, yeah, I guess contest from, from North, who were mm. really strong in that space early. I thought they were sharp and winning ground balls um, time after time in the, in the first you know, quarter and a half of that game of footy. It completely dropped away. So this is my criticism on North. And we said it last week. They'll get praise for that performance. That, yeah. that, the people will say, oh, they were good for a half, weren't they? Did you, did you see that they, the way they played for a half? And I'll say, well, hang on. You're 33 points up. They should have won. In the back stages of yeah. quarter two against a team who's got serious injuries, mm. finished 14th last year, and you're playing at home and you lose by 26 points, I think it was. Yeah. Like, that, that cannot be a performance worthy of praise. And until they get to that point, and until they don't accept the 33 uncontested marks in quarter three and the easy stoppage goals, they're not going to improve. And mm. you're going to get half a footy and competitive for a quarter here and a quarter there. And it just can't be good enough with the amount of talent that they've now assembled and a four-time premiership coach who, who's in control. 
Right, let's get to our Saturday star now, and it is Luke Jackson. He dominated this contest, and he was huge in the second half as Fremantle came from behind. 24 disposals, 21 hitouts, a couple of goals as well. It's his midfield now. Uh, that, that's what I, I looked at this and go, it's your midfield. It's you and Sarong and Brayshaw and Young's a young player, and then you get the bit part players around them. But uh, it was a, just a huge performance. He turned the game. Their midfield numbers there. I love the score involvements, double digits. Mm. I love his ability to drift forward from the ruck and score, not as a forward. He's not a forward, he's a ruckman. And if he keeps playing like this, he's probably going to be the best ruckman in the game. So, I mean, it comes with some problems with, with, with Sean Darcy when he gets sound and, and what you do with him because they look so much better when Jackson is at the centre bounce and then following up like this. Like the, the handball stuff here, the ground ball level play, the shepherd, that's what they got him for. That's that was like they paid. Nui. Yeah, and he can't do that from the forward line. He's, mm. He does that from the ruck and that's where he does his damage. And Sean Darcy's not a ruckman. So minor problem there with what they do. But right now, the midfield's in good hands. All right, let's get to our Amy Clangers now. Who covers Clangers? Amy does. And we'll start with Rowan Marshall. This is an uncontested mark, and he just lets it bonk off his head. Oh, it's about the only mistake he made for the night. <laughs> he was fantastic, was, he was 11 he? clearances he had, but uh, just late in the game, a bit of fatigue set in. And Tom um, Hawkins. I reckon someone at the Adelaide Oval crowd said something to him here, because have a look at his reaction afterwards. <laughs> we need the replay. Just, just a cheeky little grin. Is a, I'm, I'm pretty good. Game 350 <laughs> next week, and he kicked four, <laughs> and he doesn't look like he's slowing down this guy, but this guy does. Bro, he's one of the best kicks in the league. I don't know. That's got to be the worst one he's ever it's, kicked. It's probably the it? worst game of football I've seen from Brody Smith, and I'm a big Brody <laughs> Smith fan. He had an awful night, and that kick there summed it up. He doesn't have many bad ones, but he had, a, he had a shocker on Friday night. Let's stay at the Adelaide Oval Friday night footy where Geelong won. They moved to 2-0 and o and they, co they kept Adelaide to 0-2. Have a look at this. this. You must be tearing your hair out if you're a Crows supporter. Countless times where they had the man in space, easy kick to elite. And we'll show, show some examples of Geelong doing the exact same thing. This is as good a vision as you're going to see. So our gurus upstairs have spent all day putting this together and this just shows the difference in the mm. two teams on the night. No pressure there for a skillful player in Dawson. That's got to give you forwards a chance. Yeah. The defend, that's what defenders want. They want pressure on the ball, high, long, to give them a chance to actually defend one on one. You can't defend that. Like good, yeah. good luck if you're going to play there and defend that on Henry leading up. You just can't stop it. So, I mean, we, we, we're going to show a number of them. This is mm. the worst one of the night. Yeah. Pedler had just an awful second term where he butchered the ball three times. That's got to go to Walker there and he gives him an absolute spray. Walker himself was guilty of a couple. Myers was big. He had yeah. 26. He kicked three himself. And that's silver service. So this is the difference. My concern on Adelaide is, have they drafted too many of the same midfielders? Mm. So Berry, Saligo, Henry, uh, Crouch is in there, Laird's in there. They're all similar players where they're really tough and contested. But when it comes time to hit an easy kick, Pedler, um, that is a real weakness in their game. And uh, that was a poor performance and that vision's confronting for mm. them. Tom Stewart, milestone night for him, and he had it all his own way. Ten intercept marks. We'll take you behind the goals, Kane. Tell me, can you see any similarities in these oh. ten intercept marks? Yeah, what do you know when you play Geelong? Don't let Tom Stewart mark the footy. That, that's probably number one thing you put on the board. So to do that, you actually have to put someone on him or near him. Now, they started with Pedler on him. That's a bizarre matchup, And then they gave up. So I, I'm at the game, and I couldn't take my eyes off this guy. So we'll celebrate him as a player in game 150 and how elite he is and as good as we've seen anyone. But then we'll question the coaching tactics of Matthew Nix, who is sitting in the box with a bird's eye view going, he's taken six intercept marks before half time. Mm. And we allow him to do this all night, all night, and not one person went near him. So why don't they put keys on him? Benny Keys yeah. has done great defensive forward role. Now, he doesn't Certainly have the has. height of Tom Stewart, but he's crafty and he gets off him in a kick and kick goal and he's desperate and he won't let Tom Stewart mark the footy. So Matthew Nix, the contract was signed, it yeah. was announced. I thought he, he had an awful night from the coaches. I could not believe that you could let Tom Stewart stand there and mark the footy like that all alone, take 10 intercept marks and play one of the great games we've seen as an interceptor. And I think the Adelaide coaches need to really have a good look at themselves this week. Well, they're 0-2 now, the Crows, and it doesn't get any Tough easier draw. for them. They've got Freo away next week. We've spoken numerous times over the last 12 months about their away record. Then they've got Gather Round, they've got Melbourne, but then Carlton the way Essendon at home. At 0-2, they've got to play finals this year, I think. It, it becomes really difficult for them. They went really early on the contract extension. Didn't need to go that early on it. It's going to get pretty awkward if they're 1-5, and five, which they could be. 
and then there'll be some questions asked because they've, they've signed him for three years and we all like him. He's, he's a really nice guy and uh, has a good connection with his playing group, but his winning percentage is 34%. He's never been to the finals and they've started 0-2 and two against two teams that didn't play finals last year. Now, Tom Stewart took 10 intercept marks. The 11th could have been the best of the lot. He missed breaking the record because wow. he dropped that. That would have been mark of the year, wouldn't it, after wow. round two? Wow. Well, I think I've seen goal of the year, and that was Cameron, his teammate, last week. That no one's beating that. that. That would be one of the best we've seen in the last ten years. I'm really flat. I'm really flat. He dropped that. I'm sure he's flat. Not that as they well. win anything anymore. Like, they, they didn't drop a car. I don't even think they win a prize. The market is a joke. That is true. All right, let's get to the rest of the round now. We start in Ballarat, where the Western Bulldogs host. Gold Coast, they need a victory. The Dogs, Richmond play Port Adelaide in Travis Boak's 350th and West Coast take on the Giants to finish round two. We will, of course, get to our Canes questions now. You send them in at AFL on Twitter every Saturday evening. Charlie Gibb, too, wants to know how to port stop Tom Lynch. Well, they've got some good options now. So, Aaliyah will go to him, but he's the sole focus. So, then you get Radaglia dropping off and pressure up the field as well. Tom Lynch is the only option. They'll be pretty predictable going towards him. Sky cap division, what should West Coast's <laughs> priority be against GWS to stay competitive? Well, they, they need to just... The pressure's got to be there. Last yeah. week it wasn't. So Port Adelaide's ability to transition the ball from back 50 to forward 50, I hope it's not as easy for the Giants, although I fear it might be. And Jordan wants to know, what did you teach Trav Boak throughout his career? Well, I didn't teach him anything, but he taught me a lot. And <laughs> I don't know how deep you want to get, but he's a, he's a great family man. He's an incredible worker, works hard at getting better every day, but then has a really good connection mm. with the playing group as well when it's time to, to relax and have a good time. So good luck to Trav and his family tomorrow, the 23rd player to play game mm. 350 and only the 15th to do it at one club. Amazing. 350 games. Congratulations to Travis Boak. Thank you for your time, Kane. We'll see you next week. See you next week.